everyone loves a good villain, and I would argue that any true great villain had a great contrast with the great hero. Ah, Barry the Platypus, what an unexpected surprise! Would Plankton be a truly great villain if not for how great Mr. Krabs is? Would watching Aang develop into the Avatar be as great if we didn't watch Zuko develop with the intent of facing the Avatar someday? I mean, I can go on all day. Batman and Joker, Aku and Samurai Jack, Robin Gumball, Twitter and a Happy Day. These are all great examples of contrast. The team of Cuphead developed a perfect rival for the little guy, and apparently, it's the devil. Now, as you may know, Cuphead doesn't have any narrative substance, because it's not like shows like Voltron or The Owl House, a show that totally didn't have episodic moments within it but still had a main plot. I mean, the episode where they all switch bodies to learn more about each other, that's totally not an episodic plot, I've never seen that before ever, it's totally unique. Or an episode about reviving a house, because that totally played a part in the grand scheme of the show, right? Now, because of that, I probably shouldn't tell you that this is the third and four episodes that directly deal with the devil in a linear fashion, similar to an arc so far. And I I can't legally tell you that they start off the episode with continuity from its prior episodes, Carnival, where he lost a game made by the devil and now owes his soul, and Roll the Dice, where he was nearly conned into giving up his soul via King Dice. But what I can tell you is that taking the opening scenes directly from Carnival, but twisting it was a great choice to subvert expectations to the viewer, and also directly reinforce that Cuphead's soul will be a major part of this season. Remember me? I think of you often, though, from the front yard. Your soul is mine! In the words of the late great Biggie, it was all a dream. And in the face of Mugman when Cuphead screams, waking up from his nightmare, this is a frequent enough occurrence for him to want to solve this once and for all. It's a great touch because in Carnival, when caught off guard from the devil, he wanted nothing but to run away from him. But even someone as skittish as himself, he wants to tackle this problem head on. Meanwhile, the devil is like a kid in a candy store, watching all of his underpaid, overworked, non-credited workers toil away at gluttony, famine, and misery, just like... up the devil to enjoy the acts of evil but also have his demeanor be closer to cartoonish. The way that he is voices sound very proper but also have this air of ego in such a wacky way gives off this undeserved legitimacy to his character that I enjoy a lot. Even the way that he takes all the credit and throws a party for himself, it just seems like the type of activity one would do when they think they're the center of the universe. The supporting characters in these scenes are great too, including the auditor, stick in the mud, Stickler. There is one outstanding soul in need of collection. He played so ball he was on roll the dice as of today's date his soul remains uncollected so how do you know so much about this well i'll tell you i don't want to spoil roll the dice too much because i am going to cover it soon but you can deduce from this episode that king dice was not successful in taking cuphead's soul we the viewers would get two episodes in between ghosts ain't real and root packed but as far as any fallout from roll the dice there wasn't any getting back to the main duo they reach this source of water activating it via a jawbreaker to get the water all fizzed up, revealing the sage advisor, Quadratus, the great and wise, rumored to know all via Mugman. Now, if one were being chased by the devil for their soul, and this was much of a problem, you may ask, why Mugman didn't come here sooner? Well, the answer to that is, you don't have a reason? Well, all right, don't worry about that. Quadratus gives Mugman the advice of hugging Cuphead when in a pinch and an invisible ball of yarn to knit. But knit what? An invisible sweater that will keep the devil at bay? But with the catch. You must knit the sweater. Hey, why do I gotta do all the work? The sweater is only effective if it's made with brotherly love. Oh man, could you imagine if we were talking about two sisters and this ball of yarn still had to be knit with brotherly love? Wait, I said imagine, not Google search. Put Google down. <sighs> so, up to this point, we've seen a devil be bothered by the persistent and persnickety auditor Stickler, and Cuphead be inconvenienced for his benefit by Mugman. Without Stickler or Mugman, the story wouldn't have worked this way. Cuphead is way too impulsive to have protected himself, but the devil wouldn't have cared to collect it if this blemish on his record wasn't so incessantly shoved in his face. In essence, their rivalry is due to pressure on both sides to protect their butts, or assets if you want to be professional, but also punny and slip under the radar. It's 
it's actually quite fascinating that Stickler has this much effect on the devil. It makes you think about who's above the devil, if anyone, and how they'll play out. Because if not, why does the audit matter if you're on top? The devil then recreates everyone's first experience with Adblock. Let's make it snappy. Hey, it worked! In a rule of threes, the devil would go on to use increasingly deceptive practices in order to con Cuphead out of removing his sweater so the devil can take his soul. From a freak show, to free food, even imitating Quadratus into being a voice of authority to convince Cuphead to take his sweater off. Now, I'm not gonna call myself an expert at rattling the old hot dog, but Mugman was suspiciously quick to see that there was lettering on it, which no rational person would have found that quickly. It also adds a layered reason as to why the devil cares so much about Cuphead's soul. Because on top of this layer is Stickler, who will continue his audit until the soul is collected. But everything in this episode is from the devil's perspective, about how they're better than ever, breaking all of the records, doing a fantastic job. And then there's this one blemish that he could simply not stop remembering. It also doesn't help that the majority of these interactions is just Mugman stopping Cuphead from making a bad decision. It almost seems like the smart idea is just to get Mugman away if you want to do something, but the devil isn't a smart person, he's just a hot person. And it was probably a better way to word that. You should try transforming into someone who doesn't fail all the time! <laughs> 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 As we get to the peak of this episode, the devil recreates the YouTube comment section, getting heated for absolutely no reason amongst other big-headed children, and magically it appears to be working in his favor because Cuphead, technically wearing two tops, is subconsciously getting the need to take one off to be cooler. Why didn't they just run away? Well, I guess they need to conserve all the energy they had standing still. The tension rises alongside the general pressure as the only thing that stopped Cuphead from taking off the sweater so far was Mugman, who undoubtedly is overruled by his overheated brother until he remembers, when in doubt, hug it out. What you're seeing is advanced warfare. Even when using all of his energy and heat to practically melt the sweater off of Cuphead, nothing tops brotherly love, which is either wholesome or cheesy depending on how you slice it. I personally prefer my cheese cubed or shredded, but the devil's attempts are fruitless as Mugman always had the upper handle. And if we get to the meat and potatoes of this, while the devil is a perfect rival for Cuphead, Mugman is the perfect side dish to their rivalry, bridging Cuphead's empty cupness alongside the sugar high nature of these episodes to create a dynamic that will get Netflix that bread alongside Cuphead's highly anticipated DLC, which is already out, and future games. And also, I'm very hungry right now. The whole point is, Cuphead's bravado is against the Devils, but given that the Devil is a lot more powerful, the way they choose to offset this is to make it a better match, is to pit the Devil against Cuphead's bravado, but also against Mugman's smart and less impulsive but anxious nature. And to me, that's a great dynamic to build an arc from, alongside Chalice's arc, even if there are some episodic moments along the way. The Devil decides to do what any rational embodiment of evil would do, and simply squ- the records, making the auditor have to start all over because of his pursuit to be detail oriented. Where is the soul that has been retrieved? Um... I put it in the soul vault with the others. You mean you didn't register it? We have a tracking system in place. Every soul must be officially attacked. <laughs> It doesn't ruin the reputation of the devil because the workers were already okay with the party because they needed a break, the devil's right hand henchman already knew about this, and was okay with sweeping it under the rug, and as we'll get to, there was a part 2, which I'll get around to after I take a break and eat. YouTube doesn't give us paid lunch. You look mad for somebody who just got that cup sold. Congratulations, by the way. Run! 
actually get his soul yet, okay? This guy can use some yoga and tea because he's definitely gonna get some wrinkles by the age of 35. Someone should tell him that wrath is a sin. Who does he think he is? The devil? Henchman provides a clever hint to what this episode will revolve around. The Obliterator, a theme park ride that is supposed to be very fast and dangerous. So fast and dangerous that it'll tear your clothes right off. Of course, being as hard-headed as his head is round, he decides to hyper-focus on Cuphead and Mugman, essentially trying to grab his soul all day, being foiled by the invisible sweater, even the way he just tries to brute force it. While a little odd because he got a bit farther in his ruse when he tried to be sneaky, it just emphasizes the ego of this guy. He's incredibly fun to watch and react to everything. Literally as impulsive as Cuphead and Mugman could be, all it takes is a week and I'm pretty sure they would have forgotten about the sweater. But that probably wouldn't have been as fun to watch or animate. Hand it over! Oh! Would you get out of here? Elder Kettle can't see you! Look, just meet me around back! Listen, you little shoehorn! Who would have known that Cuphead and Mugman were Sigma males, making the devil use the back door to conduct business? If you remember the first part, Sorter Off Dead, or even Carnival, the very first episode, Cuphead, but mostly Mugman, was super afraid of the devil. It's a very cool progression to see him understand that with the sweater on, the devil is mostly harmless. Being overexposed to the devil in such a short time also helped, as each time he's been largely unsuccessful, despite his intensity leading you to believe that he is the one in control. Not only that, but they put over Elder Kettle as the one in charge of the four, being the true Sigma male or Sigma Cup. As Cuphead and Mugman are trying to sneak away to the Obliterator without waking him up. Unfortunately, after their very quiet conversation, Elder Kettle's supersonic hearing causes their plans to be foiled. Ah, uh, just kidding. Of course they yell. And of course Elder Kettle wakes up. And of course, he gave them chores to paint the fence, which Cuphead and Mugman throw onto the deal in exchange for Cuphead taking off the sweater for the devil. Ooh, yes. <laughs> have you ever actually painted a fence? Yeah, looks like you have no idea what you're doing. Is that so? What leads this is a fantastic moment where through use of classical music, specifically in the Hall of the Mountain King from Edward Grieg, a piece that everyone should know, and later on, Dance Macabre by Camille Saint-Saëns, we see the intertwining of lovely free-flowing animation combined with dramatic classical music, which only accentuates the ego and vanity of the devil. To take something as boring as Painting the Fence, which is a reference to the adventures of Tom Sawyer, which I believe the Fairly Odd Parents did back in the day too, and make this activity of repainting the fence into this grand gesture of a statement to prove others wrong. Cuphead and Mugman, not being their first rodeo, decide to sneak out of work to have fun again, like in Carnival. And that is how you paint a fence! Where did those two nitwits go? Wait, what did he step in? While the first episode dealt largely with the pressure put on the devil via the auditor and Cuphead and Mugman, a monkey wrench is thrown into the fray in this episode. Cuphead takes off his sweater. What is it earlier that I said about Cuphead being impulsive? What? That's not true. I absolutely talked about this. In fact, hold up, let me find it. Literally as impulsive as Cuphead and Mugman could be, all it takes is a week and I'm pretty sure they would have forgotten about the sweater. But that probably wouldn't have been as fun to watch or anime. Ah, see? I'm not crazy. I'm just a fully grown adult speaking into an inanimate object about moving pictures made for the demographic of children. It's clearly a difference. Obviously, Mugman acts in a way one would if they left the oven on at home because this entire time, all he has pushed was to keep on the sweater no matter what? They make it crystal clear in both parts that this is the only reason Cuphead still has his soul. Luckily, they speak about the fence to buy them some time. How do we know you painted the fence? Go look! It's actually quite good. We've been waiting in line all day to ride the obliterator. Hey boss! It's the obliterator, remember? It'll tear the clothes right off of you. Then something magical happens for the rest of this episode. The devil is no longer chasing. He's waiting. Waiting for Cuphead and Mugman to ride the obliterator that is advertised to tear off the sweater for good. That tiny switch enables one of my favorite dynamic moments to see in animation, when the villain actually has a good time with their enemy. In this case, the main protagonist, Cuphead. You know what's worse than finding half a worm in your apple? Falling in a sewer. <laughs> I saw a smile! 
most certainly did not. They actually get along, being both impulsive, rude, stubborn, just in their own unique way. But the devil can't help but laugh at a few jokes that Cuphead has, which are very brash and violent, which I would imagine would be up the alley of someone who calls himself the devil. Maybe I'm just a sucker for wholesome moments, but I think what makes it really work here is that they had nothing but time in that long line to the obliterator. So it would make sense given that Cuphead did largely the same thing and rolled the dice of being very talkative to King Dice, using that charm he doesn't know that he has until he meets a chalice in Charm's way. However, all wholesome things, unfortunately, must come to an end. And then the banana says, Thursday! <laughs> <laughs> Ah, how delightfully unexpected. You're not so bad after all. Thanks. <gasps> You're not wearing the sweater! Although breaking up what apparently was a funny conversation, the impulsiveness of Cuphead isn't his downfall yet, as Mugman saves the day with doing the unconventional. Rather than putting the sweater on Cuphead and saving him for the rest of his life, he puts the sweater on the devil, who at worst will be largely hurt but eventually get that sweater off at some point, and most likely isn't going to be stupid enough to give the sweater back to Cuphead. Mind you, in Sweater Off Dead, Quadratus said that he gave the last invisible yarn to Mugman, which means that that sweater was their only line of defense, which is gone now. Well, that went just as I planned. No! <laughs> Sorry, boss. And where is the sweater now? It's hidden away in an undisclosed location. And just letting my writer brain play around with this idea, there are a lot of ways out of this. The henchmen could put it in a stupid location. They can simply find another way to protect Cuphead. The devil can forget until the auditor brings it back up. Maybe they play another game to decide who takes the soul. The possibilities are endless. Let's just hope they pick a good idea. I will say the second half is much more simple than the first, but again, they build up the devil to have a specific reason to target Cuphead. There are a lot of great moments, and they show both their pros and cons, they show that they're not that different from each other, and that in a different set of circumstances, they might have even been good friends. That's why I think the Cuphead show has been crafting an amazing rival for Cuphead, the devil. Until then, I have one more episode that I want to cover of the original 12 before new episodes come out later this year. If there is one that you would like for me to cover, let me know in the comments down below. And until then, take care. Alpha out.